Hello. Good afternoon. Um, and welcome to this talk. It's a little weird to be talking in, uh, in this format, but I hope it goes okay. Um, let me share with you an image. or try to. Okay. Here we go. Um, so today I'm going to use some images, some photographs, a film clip, um, and a logo to talk to you about the sounds of socialism, or what I'm calling the sounds of socialism, um, which is just a part of my book. Um, and here you see a cover image of the book and a list of the table of contents. I'm mostly going to be talking about things that come from chapter two and especially chapter four and a little bit chapter five, um, or referring to them. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of what the sweep of the book does or tries to do. Um, and I wanna give you just sort of a general, begin with a sort of general statement about what I'm trying to do in the book. And also, um, I'll just warn you, I'm going to be reading my notes because um, I don't want to get lost or go off on tangents um, and take up too much time. I hope to speak for about 35, maximum 40 minutes, and I hope you'll have lots of questions for me. Um, so in Powerful Frequencies, uh, I argue that studying radio as a technology and an institution brings affect to an analysis of the state through the exploration of sound states and aspirational states, which is another way of thinking about um, what liberation movements are and do. Um, so states and, and liberation movements broadcast to national and international audiences to inform, influence opinion, destabilize their enemies, and forge a community of listeners. In the book, I look at how people use and interpret radio. Um, so I'm always interested in the relationship between people, technology, and institutions. And I think about how radio technology shapes listening and how the work that radio does shapes not only what's said on the radio, but how and why it matters. Um, and so I also think about sound's affective qualities, how it makes listeners nervous or how it nurtures their pride or maybe even stokes their boredom. So today I'm gonna to talk about sound, what I'm calling the sounds of socialism focusing on the liberation struggle and the first years of independence in Angola. Um, as I said before, I'm gonna use a film clip, some photographs and a logo, and I hope that I will be showing you how thinking about sound opens up different kinds of analysis and different perspectives on history and in particular on Angola's first decade of independence. So moving along. So the image that you see now is a still from Miguel Gomez's 2012 film, Taboo. Miguel Gomez is a Portuguese filmmaker. The film has two parts, Paraíso Perdido is the first part, Paradise Lost, and Paraíso, uh, Paradise is the second part. I'm gonna focus on the second part um, called Paraíso. So in that part of the film, we see the insular white world of Portuguese settlers in a colony somewhere in Africa. And the colony, you know, which colony it is, is never named um, and is not entirely clear. Aurora, who you see pictured here in the image on the left, is a young Portuguese woman raised there in the colony and married to a wealthy white tea farmer. She is pregnant. This is her husband um, in the photograph or in the still. She's also having a love affair with an Italian man living in the colony. Um, in the second part of the film, then, is an extended flashback recounted in voiceover by Aurora's lover, a man named Gianluca. We see the mouths of the characters moving, but we do not hear their voices. The only voice we hear is the voice of Gianluca. So, for example, when, when Aurora speaks, we don't actually hear her voice, we just see her mouth move. Um, we see the mouths of the characters moving, but we don't hear the voices. So Gomez um, goes a step further in his representation of Africans in the film. 
they are entirely mute. That is, they do not speak at all. We do not even hear their, uh, we do not even see their mouths moving. Um, we're led to believe um, they're depicted as if not having voices. Um, African characters are background for white romance and drama, as this image, I think, aptly demonstrates. Um, so throughout really the, all, almost all of the second part of the film until the very last minutes, we never hear the voices of Africans. Um, and I want to show you a film clip in just a second, but I want to set that up a little bit. So Aurora, eight months pregnant, and John, Jean Luca have run away. Mario, a priest and friend of John Luca's, who's also a friend of Aurora's husband, follows them to try to convince them to return uh, to the city and to the, to the plantation. In a scuffle, Aurora shoots and kills Mario. It's kind of a stunning scene, eight months pregnant woman uh, shooting man dead. Um, yeah, so Aurora shoots and kills Mario. Two young boys witness the scene. They lead Aurora and John Luca to a nearby village. Um, and amid the rendezvous of a very stereotypical looking African village, Aurora, quote, goes mute, only screaming with the pain of early contractions, unquote. She gives birth. John Luca um, had sent for her husband. The husband appears and he takes Mario, um, he takes Aurora and Mario's corpse away. Um, and John Luca remains and he hears a radio broadcast. And that's where the, the film clip that I'm going to now show you begins. So this will be um, a little bit of a technical feat. So one second, stop this. Seria divulgado um misterioso comunicado sobre a morte de Mário, que hoje é tido como um dos factos marcantes para o começo da guerra colonial. O movimento de libertação reivindica a morte do referido membro das milícias colonialistas como ação de guerra. O indivíduo representante dos ocupantes brancos foi abatido no quadrante 45, conhecido por Mocanje, onde foi surpreendido em ações de espionagem com o intuito de revelar ao regime opressor posições estratégicas das forças vivas e revolucionárias africanas. As nossas forças populares continuarão a sua luta até a libertação total do nosso povo e da nossa pátria. To this. So that radio broadcast that enters into um, the sound of the film in the name of the liberation movement is the first time, aside from singing, singing that we hear there and singing that we hear earlier in the film, um, this is the first time that we, an African voice actually enters into the soundtrack of the film. Um, the voice is very stilted, you know, it sounds like he, he's, he's uh, reading something written, sort of like I saw. Um, so this is the official voice of the liberation movement claiming that they have murdered Mario. So just to repeat the quotation from the film, quote, the freedom movement takes responsibility for the death of this member of the colonialist militia as an act of war, unquote. 
But for those of us have seen, who have seen the film, um, we know that that claim is a lie. The liberation movement didn't kill Mario. Aurora shot Mario. But what the scene does it, is that it announces the symbolic birth of African independence, and it announces one part of the post-colonial problematic. Actually, it doesn't so much announce African independence as it announces um, the, the liberation struggle. Um, but I definitely think it raises the question of um, part of the post-colonial, what I'm gonna call the post-colonial problematic. So the, the choppy stern voice of the guerrilla announcer reminds us that even though liberation movements claim to be the authentic voice of the people, they are in fact representations. In the scene, you can hear that tension between the song this, or the singing um, and the radio announcer's forced sound. Furthermore, the announcer's statement is propaganda, um, what I call in the book a kind of true lie, or a strategic fiction in which the liberation movement claims it has killed Mario, though we know Aurora did it because we saw it. In this scene, the voice of the liberation movement and its counter narrative erupt into the sound of the film. So this brings me to my next image and to liberation movement radios, not in fictional film, but in fact in Angolan history. Um, the MPLA and the FNLA, two of Angola's three liberation movements, had radio, broad, um, radio programs, excuse me, that broadcast during the anti-colonial war. Um, the MPLA station program was called Angola Combatente, uh, Fighting Angola, and or Fighting Angolan, and um, the FNLA's program was called Voz Libre de Angola, uh, or the Free Voice of Angola. Both of these programs were broadcast from neighboring countries. Angola Combatente is the most widely remembered, and it's the one also that appears most frequently in the secret police archives. Um, people also remember um, vividly um, and recount these memories in a very animated way, listening to Angola Combatente under their beds, in dark and abandoned football fields, under desks, and with the volume turned very low, and typically listening alone, um, and maybe only dis discussing it later with very trusted friends. Listening to Angola Combatente fed a sense of revolt and a sense of participating in the struggle that was unfolding hundreds of kilometers away on different fronts. Angola Combatente broadcast coded messages uh, explaining when people had arrived in code, um, threats to the colonial regime, and ponderous analysis of colonial political economy. In, in a sense, um, these were the first sounds of socialism, right? Critiques of colonial political economy. Angola Combatente addressed Angolans living in the territory, Portuguese soldiers encouraging them to abandon um, the Portuguese army, and finally also addressed themselves to international listeners. So this image is one panel of a mural painted on the walls surrounding Luanda's military hospital. If you've ever been to Luanda, you have likely seen this mural. It's a piece of post-independence public art that tells the history of the liberation struggle from the perspective of the MPLA. Um, and it's one of the few pieces, I would say, of post-independence um, art and commemoration that still remains, right? It's constantly repainted. Um, you can see the red dust in the bottom of the image. It's always struggling against that red dust, but it, the, these panels continue to be um, refreshed every number of years. Um, so it's just meters away from what is today Angolan National Radio and what in the colonial period was the, um, the uh, official broadcasting um, or the official broadcaster of Angola. It's in a zone of the city that was part of uh, colonial urban modernization plans that used concrete to confront the liberation movement broadcasts that invaded the colonial soundscape from uh, Congo Brazzaville and Congo Kinshasa. This panel of the mural depicts a scene of secret listening to the MB MPLA's Angola Combatente, an image that would have been very familiar to people who had listened to it, um, although not necessarily um, listening in groups. So here I'm interested in a couple of things. First, how sound affects the body, body physically and emotionally. And secondly, how sound is represented in images. Um, first, in terms of thinking about how sound affects the body physically and emotionally, we know from the secret police, uh, PED and military archives that the, um, that the very idea of Angolans listening to Angola Combatente 
made those officers very, very nervous. I know this from reading thousands of pages of these documents, both the transcriptions and the memos that often accompanied them. Um, the fear of PEAT agents um, and soldiers and military soldiers um, see, honestly seems far out of proportion to the numbers of people listening to radios or the numbers of radios even in Angola and available at the time. Um, and this actually points to something very true about how radio works as a technology, or rather their fear, their nervousness points to something um, that is uh, related to how radio functions as a technology. Um, and this is something that sound studies people call or refer to as transduction. So radio changes sound energetically as the waves move across and through the radio. Radios transform immaterial sound waves into material effects. Radio sounds enter the human ear and vibrate the tympanic membrane, which sends electrical impulses through the cochlear nerve to the brain. In other words, the radio uh, or radio sound, sound waves actually touch the nervous system of, of the human body. Radio sound touches the body's nervous system directly. PEAT files don't mention the process of transduction, but they repeatedly worry about, quote, um, the electrifying effects, unquote, that Angola Combatente might have on listeners. Reading these files, you can almost <clears throat> feel the fear of the PEAT agents. Just like when listening to people recount their memories of listening in secret, you can sense their fear, their excitement, and the, the, the sense of danger they experience. So this brings me to my second point about this image from the mural. Um, none of the, those emotions, not fear, not excitement, not danger, not inspiration, nothing, nothing, um, are evident in this mural panel. Typically, I would say visual depictions of sound sort of suck. This one is particularly flat. We don't even have the little lines around the radio. And in fact, the radio also isn't named. Um, what we see in this scene of secret listening is the secret consumption of MPLA media. The newspaper, Vittorio Mort, which has its name on it, um, and the radio, which we can assume to be Angola Combatente. Um, but this mural panel really only makes sense to those people who know the story of Angola Combatente, or people who heard it, and its importance to, um, to people's memories of this period. This mural requires people's memories, in fact, to enliven it. Um, and in fact, today in 2020, it's an image that probably doesn't make sense to many of those born in the past 20 years that pass by here on a daily basis. It's not an image that at all captures the dynamism of the MPLA's Angola Combatente. It is an image, in a sense, um, that we might describe as mute. It is one that stifles the voices that once sizzled across the airwaves. But maybe that is just what the MPLA wanted. So as I said earlier, Radio Nacional de Angola, which was um, formerly the official Angolan broadcaster in the colonial period, sits just meters away from that mural. It's a mid-century brutalist structure um, built by, uh, designed and built by the Angolan architect um, Fernand Lopes Simões de Carvalho, who provided me with this picture very kindly. Um, and I read this building as part of the colonial state's response to the nervousness that the liberation movement radios, and particularly Angola Combatente, inspired. Um, this was part of a larger counterinsurgency project, this building. Um, at independence, it became the national broadcaster, and its name changed in a series of a flurry, or a flurry of decrees that were issued after independence. On December 8th, 1975, um, the once emisora oficial de Angola became Radio Nacional de Angola, and it adopted the call sign from Luanda, capital of the Popular Republic of Angola. This is Angolan National Radio, broadcasting in connection with the national network of transmitters. Um, but changing the colonial era broadcaster, a key part of the counterinsurgency project, as I just mentioned, turning that into a national broadcaster was an enormous undertaking that would take at least a decade. Um, and it's one that did not begin in earnest until after May 27th, 1977. So now I want to talk about um, sounds of socialism as generated by, by the new radio station, and then I'm going to talk about the Vinci Sets Mile, so a little bit out of chronological order. Um, so unlike the image of the radio in the military hospital, oops, wait, I have another image, sorry. Switch. Here we go. Um, 
some of you may be familiar with this image. I don't know how much time you've spent looking at it, but I've spent a lot of time looking at it. Um, so unlike the image of the radio in the military hospital mural, this image does not mute sound. In this logo, we see a, a cogwheel or, or a gear or part of one, a machete and a star, three symbols also present on the Angolan flag. The gear represents industrial labor. The machete symbolizes agricultural work. Some people say it also symbolizes the um, Revolução das Catanas, the uprising on February 4th, 1961. Um, and the star signals international, international socialist solidarity. These symbols sit atop a radio tower and the curved lines suggest sound waves. We can think of this logo as showing us that Radio Nacional de Angola broadcasts the sounds of socialism as well as industry, agriculture, and solidarity. And I think it's interesting to note, um, I don't really have much more to say about <laughs> this particular part of it, but I think it's interesting to note that in fact, um, this is still, this is the current logo of Radio Nacional de Angola, um, despite the changes beginning in the late 1980s and early 1990s in terms of opening up to um, market forces. So all of these elements, uh, industrial labor, agricultural work, um, and international solidarity, some more than others, did in fact enter, enter into Radio Nacional de Angola's broadcasting after independence. And here I'm thinking about programs like Trabalho e Luta, um, Work and Struggle, where um, a, radio, a team of broadcasters would go to visit factories in the morning um, in and around Rwanda, but also in other places in the country, um, to report on uh, you know, sort of union organizing on the floors, um, what they were producing, um, and things like that. They also sometimes uh, reported stories about what figures that were seen as counter-revolutionaries, people that were not inspiring work or were not working efficiently. Um, other ex uh, examples of how these symbols sort of were actualized in terms of sound would include um, a, a broadcast from the Cade farm in, I believe in Kwanzaa Sul, um, that was reflecting on the collective coffee production and the, and the, and the brigades of people working on those, on those coffee farms. Um, and thirdly, we would hear um, and can think about internationalist solidarity being broadcast in the programs of SWAPO and the ANC, both of which broadcast from the building of Radio Nacional de Angola um, to their own guerrilla camps and further afield. Um, and we might also think about, for example, the, the broadcasting that I talk about in chapter five of the book, which were uh, reports on Namibia's independence that were also quite quite an important part of educating Angolans um, about the struggle in Southern Africa, the regional struggle against apartheid, um, or what was known as Angola's second liberation struggle. Um, so these were all, these all featured in the kinds of programming that occurred at Radio Nacional de Angola. Um, at, at Radio Nacional de Angola, old and new professionals developed programming and created the socialist structures that the MPLA promised but couldn't deliver. So in other words, um, People had to be um, had to be seen as loyal party members, MPLA party members, to work at the radio station. Um, but <clears throat> that also gave them a kind of margin of maneuver. And one of the things that they did was try to realize this kind of socialist dreams and the socialist ambitions that the MPLA had but couldn't necessarily put into practice. They did these in a number of ways. So um, the directorate at the radio station created a subsidized, privately managed lunch, lunch service, um, radio station soccer teams, um, child care facilities for, um, for employees, children, um, and other things. So, so the provision of bread monthly, the provision of, of, of gas tanks monthly, all of which were seen as ways to um, offset and to improve um, the, the limited salaries available to, to employees at the radio station. So they also helped to build a successful state institution. And in this way, I think it's important to see the ways, and I do this, I try to do this in the book, um, and look at how it is that people actually make up institutions. Um, and that's a kind of a key, a key part of the story for me. Um, so this idea of, of Radio Nacional being a successful state institution is not the story of the post-colonial African state with which we are most familiar. Um, and it's one of the things that made me, made me very interested in this particular um, moment of the radio in Angola. 
Um, and in order to access that history, we have to see the radio station as more than the mouthpiece for the one-party NPLA state. So in fact, this logo can only tell us, uh, only tells us a limited about, bit about that. Um, so let me shift gears here finally um, to look a little bit at Radio Nacional's history as told on its website, Once Upon a Time, this website is no longer active, um, and its commemorative date, October 5th, Day of the Radio. Um, moving on here. So this is a quotation from Radio Nacional's website in about 2015, um, or 2016, oh yeah, 2015, it says here. Um, that underscores the centrality of the radio to Angolan independence and its privileging among other forms of media. So I'm not gonna read you the quotation, you can read it yourselves, but it underscores the ways it sort of makes the argument that basically Radio Nacional was the first institution, um, one of the first institutions in the first public business of, of the new republic, even before independence was, was declared. Um, in fact, um, this, in lot, this, this quotation elides a history of struggle at the radio station. Um, radio Nacional was the site of a conflict in the transition between the Portuguese military coup in April 1974 and the declaration of Angolan independence in the name of the MPLA by President Agustin Neto on November 11, 1975. The contestation resulted from struggles between the three parties at the station, all of which had been um, given 30 minute uh, slots of time to broadcast um, their, their political programs. Um, but it also resisted, um, contestation also resulted from political differences within the MPLA and from challenges um, between the, the professionals from the late colonial period who stuck around um, and the new people um, from the MPLA coming in to take up uh, positions of, in the directorship um, of the radio station right after independence. In the book, um, I use a song to discuss Kudibangela and the Vintiset de Mayo. I can't do that today because of the way that Zoom compresses sound and it would, it would not sound right. Um, so since I can't play that song today, I encourage you to buy the book and read what I have to say about it. Um, Kudibangela was associated with dissidents within the MPLA, that is, with adherents of the faction of Mitu Almaj and Jose Van Dunen, what were called the Mitistas. Uh, Kudibangela began broadcasting in August of 1974, but was banned from the airwaves by President Neto by December of 1975, so just very shortly after independence. Um, but the show's well-known call sign, Kudibangela Weya Weya, that used a few beats from Mana Dibango's song, Weya, played on the airwaves on the morning of May 27, 1977, announcing the coup in, in the memories of some and also or at the very least announcing the fact that something was seriously up because the program had been banned and nobody had heard that call sign for a while. So after the failed coup, MPLA forces loyal to Neto um, jailed and murdered dissidents without trial. Uh, there are numerous estimates. There's a growing historiography and literature on this event. I'm not going to delve into that here. Um, what I want to talk about is, is the impact that it had um, on the shape and sound of Radio Nacional de Angola. So in the wake of these events, President Neto recognized the power of radio, and he appointed the former air, uh, colonial area broadcaster, Rui de Carvalho, as director. Prior to that, there had been three different directors between, um, between in the very early days, so between uh, when independence was declared in November of 1970, and the coup in late May of 77. So in about uh, 18 months, there were three different directors, none of whom had any broadcasting experience. Um, so it looked like the MPLA wasn't taking the idea of a national broadcaster very seriously until the 27 de Mayo, at which point um, Rui de Carvalho, a very skilled um, broadcaster, a, very well, a voice very well known as a sports broadcaster, um, came to be the director of the radio station. Uh, President Neto then visited the radio station on October 5th, 1977, and praised the radio for the role it played in communicating the MPLA's political orientations to the Angolan people. Um, and he described the, um, he described 
the, the radio station's installations, its building and things like that, as a kind of um, palace or mansion relative to the, the little cabana of the Journal of Angola, um, the state daily newspaper. So we could see that the radio station was really larger and, and important, and it's really only at the, after the Vinci Sets Mayo that they begin to be able um, to become a real force and institution. Um, a year after Neto's visit to the radio station, um, so on October 5th, 1978, radio employees voted to commemorate October 5th as the day of the radio. You can see that in the image here from one of the celebrations. Um, this date, October 5th, um, the day of the radio, I would argue, therefore unwittingly folds the 27 de Mayo into the official history of national broadcasting. Um, the sounds of socialism and the Angolanization of the radio um, did not happen until after the coup. The 27 de Mayo is tightly related, in other words, to the success of Radio Nacional de Angola as an institution in independent Angola. So let me just stop there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can talk. And I would love to hear any questions. Anybody have questions? So that's the book, or this is the book, or that's part of the book. This is the book. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of the, the longer history um, and Part, a lot of the book talks about that radio in the colonial period. Um, radio is part of the counterinsurgency project. Um, and those are all things I'd be happy to talk about. Um, I think radio was quite instrumental, for example, to uh, white settlers um, in the colony. They were the people that started radio. It wasn't, in fact, the colonial state. They got involved very late, only in the, in the 1950s. Um, and radio was really a sort of amateur or hobby um, uh, in the early years of radio, beginning from 1931. So I see Greg Pirio has raised his hand. I think we need you to write questions in the Q&A. Anybody's got questions? Um, so a question from Delinda uh, Collier. Um, given my research on radio and music, do I think the aural is, more is a more powerful communicative device than the visual? Um, in Angola. I'm not sure I would say it's necessarily more powerful, but it's definitely, it's definitely powerful. I mean, I think one of the things that's important about sound is that it can travel, it travels far. One of the reasons it's so important after independence is that in a moment when Angola is in a civil war and there's a tremendous amount of destruction um, and things like communication infrastructure, roads and things like that, are being destroyed by the war, the radio really gives um, the MPLA state the power to communicate across a very large territory and quite frankly beyond international boundaries as well. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about, I mean one of the things I'm interested in, in is the relationship between sound and image. I'm not, I'm not sure I communicated that very effectively with the, what I showed you today, but I do think it's interesting to try to think about them together. Sound is surely the less, um, the less favored um, medium. And I think we've, you know, we, know, ever, we know ever since the enlightenment, right? It's, we, uh, society has been and cultures have been very ocular centric. We privilege the eye in much of our language when we talk about, uh, I don't know, academic languages and other languages um, involve 
um, ocular metaphors. I see, I will demonstrate, let me illustrate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we have less, we use less the vocabulary for sound, which tells us something. And yet I think it, it's, it's profound in terms of how it, um, it touches people, how it moves people, and how it um, produces affect. So I guess that's my, my central interest in it. Um, but I would be interested to know what, what you, you all think too. Um, so Andre Swartz has asked about the process of re research um, and how I came to this idea. So working on my dissertation, which became my first book, Intonations, um, lots of people talked to me about the radio. And that was, in fact, when I heard all these stories about uh, listening to Angola Combatente in particular. And so I just was struck by the ways in which radio seems so important. And musicians also said to me things like, oh, the radio, colonial era radio was our greatest promoter. Um, and that took me into some of the, the contradictions, how it was that in fact, a music that came to be seen as um, representing Angolanidad or, or you know, kind of representing authentic Angolan music was actually promoted by the by the colonial state. So I became more and more interested in this question of, of radio and radio as an institution, um, and also very particularly the radio that the MPLA and the FNLA were broadcasting. Um, and that's how I got interested in this. I worked um, in various places. I worked in the radio station um, in Luanda briefly. I couldn't do that for a lot of time because they don't have, I mean, it's a big building, but there are a lot of people that work there and there wasn't a lot of space. Um, and they don't have a proper archive, so to speak. Um, I think one of the ironies about doing research on radio, and this is true wherever research on radio is done, is that um, much of the material, much of the archival material available to researchers is actually text. Um, programming, things like that, and not sound. Um, the Radio Nacional de Angola has a recorded sound archive, but most of what is preserved there um, are presidential speeches and things like that, or uh, the opening of party congresses and things like that. And that gives you a very good indication of, of what they're interested in, what are their priorities in terms of archiving. Um, the great, um, I found a tremendous amount of material in the secret police, um, the PED archives and the military archives in Portugal, which I didn't necessarily expect. And I had to learn a lot more about Portuguese military than I ever expected to do. Um, that said, those are both amazing archives that have a tremendous amount of material. Um, and that's where I, I came across these transcriptions of Angola Combatente. The MPLA itself does not, in fact, uh, as far as I know, or was able to find hold um, copies of, of, um, of those. There, there are a couple of, not transcriptions, but the, the programs themselves before they were broadcast, um, but very little, in fact, of the recorded sound, almost nothing. Um, so uh, anyway, the research took place over a very long time. So uh, Inej has a very good question about the relationship between capitalist practices, the state, and the media in Angolan radio. Um, one of the things that had interested me a lot about um, the story uh, the stories that I heard from people who worked at the radio, at Radio Nacional after independence, had to do um, precisely with this. One with setting up, um, essentially building the, the socialist or the, the infrastructure for socialist um, collective um, participation or, or provision and distribution within the radio station on the one hand, and how that also involved sometimes semi-capitalist practices. In the case of opening up the subsidized uh, cafeteria, that meant hiring a privately, um, hiring a, man a manager to privately manage um, the cafeteria. And it also involved negotiating with a farmer in Lubongo um, to get him to sell his produce to the radio station and then negotiating between Radio Nacional and TAG, the Angolan Airlines, so that they could um, fly the, the produce up to Luanda from, from Lubongo. Um, and I think one of the things that we see is that there, were, there in fact were sort of semi-capitalistic practices 
going on even within, even inside state institutions. I mean, we know a lot about the sort of quote unquote informal economy and what develops in, in Jorge Santero and these other markets in the city. I think we know less about actually what was happening inside these institutions. The obvious example is Sonangol, um, and we know that that functioned differently, but what interests me at Radio Nacional de Angola is that it was a different kind of state institution and already we see these kind of semi-capitalistic practices developing there. Um, Gosh, now you guys have lots of questions. I'm not sure I can get to all of them. Um, Greg Pirio asks if I came across information on how the MPLA came to expand TV during the Civil War as a way to control the increasingly urbanized audiences that fled the countryside because of the war. I did not, but I didn't work, um, I didn't work in the TV station archives. Um, that's its own thing. Um, so I know much less about that, but I do know that Rui de Carvalho, who was the, the first director of the radio station, because he was seen as such a good and effective manager, um, left the, was, was reappointed from the radio to the television station in 1982 in order to, to um, kind of reinvent the television station, which in, in 82 was still, I think, only broadcasting in, in black and white. Um, Let's see what other questions we have here. Um, so Katerina uh, Valdesia asks, what can I say about the potential role of Portuguese uh, radialists such as Sebastião Pelayu um, in re re resisting the colonial regime on the airwaves? Um, so this is a really interesting question. Um, one of the things that I mentioned but didn't expand on was the Angolanization of Radio Nacional de Angola. And Antonio Fonseca, um, who has the longest running show on Angolan radio um, called Antologia, um, he worked actually, he was a, a radio broadcaster. He started that show at um, Radio Ecclesia, which was the Catholic station in Luanda, um, and later brought it over to Radio Nacional de Angola. But he said to me, you know, at, at the moment of independence, Radio Ecclesia actually had a more Angolan sound than did Radio Nacional de Angola. Um, of course, Radio Nacional de Angola was the official Angolan broadcaster before that. It was the colonial broadcaster. Um, and the only uh, sector of that radio station that had a kind of Angolan sound in other words, people speaking in, um, in Angolan languages like um, Kimbundu and Umbundu and, and Kikongo um, was uh, Bajda Angola, which was, uh, which was itself part of the counterinsurgency project. Um, and, not, uh, and even though you know, musicians and people like that liked it, it, wasn't, um, it didn't necessarily have an Angolan sound. Um, it was people like Sebastio Coelho first um, with his radio program in the South Cruz del Sul, um, and later with Tondoya Mukina uh, Nakizomba in um, at Radio Ecclesia that really introduced um, African language broadcasts um, and also uh, were the first to introduce Angolan music on the radio. Um, and of course, Sebastio Coelho, you know, was thrown out of his job. He was jailed and then, then uh, basically under um, kind of under house arrest in Luanda could only broadcast from there. Um, so those figures were, were really important in the history of Angolan radio. They're also really important in the history of Portugal after 1974 because it's, um, it is the former settlers or children of the settlers, um, some of them who return to Portugal after 1974 and revitalize social media um, in, in Portugal. So people like Emilio Rangel, Fernando Alves, um, and others. Um, David Borges um, was a sports broadcaster, and they were they were really important figures. Um, and they got they you know cut their teeth um, in in radio in Angola. Um, let's see. Gosh, so many questions. Um, So, um, okay, so maybe picking up on that same question, um, Rogerio Santos 
um, has a question about the, the radio clubs uh, before independence. So um, the radio clubs, those were the people that really started um, the radio in Angola. It wasn't the state, as I said. Um, the state really only stepped in in the 1950s. Um, but radio broadcasting itself actually started in the 1930s in these kind of hobbyist radio clubs. Um, and these were incredibly important for connecting um, Portuguese settlers across the vast territory. I mean, Angola is a big place. It's 15 or 16 times the size of Portugal um, for people who need an American reference. It's about the size of Texas and Arizona, two of our largest states combined. It's a big place. Um, and, and that meant that settlers were often um, far apart from one another. And radio, radio and clubs and also aviation clubs um, provided a really important way for settlers to connect with one another. Um, in some ways, they were more connected with one another within Angola than they were connected to Portugal, although broadcasting to Portugal also mattered. Um, but in, one of the things that I explore in the first chapters of the book, and very particularly in the first chapter, and I use, uh, again, Miguel Gomez's film to, to discuss this, is about how, uh, has to do with how radio set up um, and or help Portuguese settlers establish a kind of sense of colonial whiteness and how radio was important in becoming white um, in Angola uh, for settlers. And in, in, in many instances, we see that um, in the archives, there, there's information that points to the ways in which those settlers were thinking about themselves within the region of Southern Africa. So they were concerned about broadcasting um, and being heard in Mozambique, which had, has its own radio tradition and, and had one very, very strong radio club. Um, and also to listeners in South Africa, there was even one proposal uh, for a program that would be in Afrikaans um, in order that, um, so that they could, they could actually develop an audience in, in South Africa. Um, so, so radio clubs were incredibly important. They were incredibly dynamic. They would invite also broadcasters from, um, from Portugal to come work there. And the scene in Angola and among the radio clubs was seen as being incredibly sort of cutting edge. Um, when the state gets involved um, in radio broadcasting beginning in the 1950s and then very seriously, um, sort of only really seriously once the um, the war once they declare war on the liberation movements um, we see that the Angolan state uh, takes up radio and and builds you know this massive radio building and yet they are also still incredibly dependent on the radio clubs um, they have a very flat notion of um, a very undynamic notion of how to write propaganda um, and in fact there's a there's a conversation between people who um, are active in the radio clubs and people working at the Emissora Oficial de Angola about the sound. Like it just sound, they say it sounds too official. Um, whereas the radio clubs were able, were, were locally based, they had a much more local sound. They, they broadcast local soccer games, they broadcast um, radio theater, they broadcast lots of different things. Um, so they were much more dynamic and incredibly important. And one of the th interesting things also about radio after independence is that it really is hard for um, whoever comes into power to convert colonial era institutions into things that serve a new and independent nation. The, the colonial era broadcaster was much more oriented towards Lisbon um, and to the interests of the colonial state than it was to regional broadcasters such that um, uh, Angolans after independence had to come up with all kinds of clever ways um, to be able to broadcast, um, for example, when uh, uh, Augustino Neto's first visit to um, Congo Brazzaville. So uh, Reginaldo Silva, who many of you may know uh, as an Angolan, Angolan journalist who worked at, at Radio Nacional, um, said they had, you know, they had to come up with this very complicated thing where Bra Brazzaville would broadcast it, they would report it in Luanda, um, and then it would be rebroadcast. Re um, and he had accompanied Neto on that trip. Um, so I think there's an interesting way in which even for as advanced as the radio was and, and the radio the, that I showed you, that building, which is today Radio Nacional de Angola, when it was built in the colonial period, it was said that it was um, the most state-of-the-art radio anywhere in Portugal, right? And that was in the colonial 
Portuguese mindset in which um, Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, and Guinea-Bissau were, you know, overseas extensions of Portugal. And so the, the most advanced, technologically advanced, the most state-of-the-art radio um, was, was in Angola. Um, and still, that did not necessarily serve or did not immediately serve nationalist purposes um, or the, the, the desires and needs of an independent government. Um, in 1975, and in fact, it took them about a decade um, to actually create a national, a whole national network. Um, in the colonial period, Emisora Oficial depended on the radio clubs for to rebroadcast things, but there was not a single network. That only happened after independence. Um, so, So yes, um, Roger is pointing out that uh, Radio Diamant also broadcast Anglo music before 1975 um, and sold programs to other radio clubs. And yes, there was a tremendous amount of circulation, not only of, of personnel, but of programs between these different stations. Um, and Sebastião Coelho's Estudios Norte um, also produced a lot of material, Emilio Rangel, Fernando Alves, that they would sell from um, uh, Radio Comercial, the, uh, D'Angola, which was based first in Lubango and then um, in Luanda, they would also record and sell shows. Um, Rogero is also asking a question about Adolfo Maria and the MPLA radio. Adolfo Maria was one of the most, um, was a really important broadcaster. The, the MPLA broadcast um, mainly from Brazzaville, but also um, briefly from Dar es Salaam. Um, and then from Lusaka, where, um, where Paulo George um, uh, and, uh, and, and Beto Traza um, and um, Ilda Carrera all worked um, for the MPLA's radio. But, but Bra Brazzaville was the, main, was the main broadcaster, and Adolfo, um, Adolfo Maria was a, was a re really key figure there. Um, and I have sometimes thought that it was... Uh, the transition that happens at the radio station after independence, which I described to you, um, in which basically people without any experience in radio were appointed to run the radio station, despite the fact of a very, history of a very strong radio um, in the MPLA guerrilla struggle, right? Um, I think one of the reasons they didn't necessarily appoint anybody that had been a broadcaster for Angola Combatente was that some of the people, and and this was the case for Adolfo Maria, were identified with a, another faction within, within the MPLA, which was the Revolta Activa. So there was just no way that he was going to be appointed director of the radio station despite his skill. Um, it's interesting to note that um, in Mozambique, um, there was a very easy transition. So the, the person that had been the, the director of Freeman Mo's um, guerrilla radio became the first director of the radio station in Mozambique after independence. That's not at all um, what happens in, in Angola. Um, let me see if I can answer maybe one more question before we wrap it up. Um, Brenwin has a question about how people talked about their memories of listening to the broadcast during the liberation struggle. Um, and whether or not I managed to interview any former Portuguese soldiers about their responses. I did not manage to, um, to interview any former Portuguese soldiers. Um, but I did, there was a bit of material in, um, in the archives that points to the military thinking about the soldiers as, as an audience. Um, I did, you know, Angol, there were also Angolans, of course, who served in the Portuguese forces. Um, and some of them later came, went on to be musicians. So some of the musicians that I spoke to had done, had to do military service and they talked about listening to the radio um, and listening sometimes to Angola Combatente with Portuguese soldiers. I think one of the interesting things about um, a fascist dictatorial regime is that it, wants, it wanted to control everybody's information. Um, so even uh, the Portuguese settlers in Angola and Portuguese soldiers who went to serve um, in what was called the colonial war in Angola um, would listen when they could to Angola Combatente to try to find out what was going on. So many people listen to Angola Combatente and the PED archives and the military archives are full also of these kinds of memos of um, catching people, sometimes Portuguese settlers, sometimes soldiers, um, 
listening to the radio or people that worked in the civil service or uh, people that would have been, been considered Angolans that would have been considered assimilados. Um, and, the, and there was a great fear that, that, you know, people that should be on the side of the Portuguese were in fact listening to Angola Combatente. There's a very good um, depiction of this in Zeze Gamboa's um, uh, Grand Quilapi, where um, uh, Joazinho arrives home late at night and finds his father listening to an enormous radio. Um, and kind of sidled up to it with, with the volume low. It's unlikely that people, you know, people did not recount listening um, in their living rooms as, as we see in that film, but they do definitely recount sort of like sidling up to the radio. Um, and many, many people listen to it. So um, Jardu uh, Muikalia, who is a member of UNITA, a high-ranking UNITA official, um, also remembered, you know, running across his father at night, um, listening to Angola Combatente, um, in, their, in the quintal of their home um, in central Angola um, and listening with the, with the line turned way, way down in order not to, to, to call attention. Um, so uh, I think that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Um, and there were also lots of interesting stories um, that emerged in these, in these secret police archives about the different ways in which people listened and how they tried to listen and how they would um, turn down the volume or turn up the volume when, when they knew somebody wasn't around. Um, or uh, an example, in, in downtown Luanda, they were, there was a group of people trying to rebroadcast um, Angola Combatente. Um, they, would, they would find out what time it was, you know, they would know what time it was playing. People remembered very clearly 7 p.m. Um, and they would tune in in a quintal and then sort of rebroadcast um, from the quintal. Um, and they said they never got turned in by their neighbors who were Portuguese because they knew that their neighbors also wanted to know what the MPLA had to say about how the war was being fought, um, et cetera. Um, okay, Shihan de Silva has a question about how important music and dance were in carving out new post-independence national identity. They were very important. Um, I write a little bit about this in my book, Intonations. Um, but one of the things I do mention in, in the new book is the ways in which people from the radio station, broadcasters, Arturo Medish and Arturo Arishkado, traveled the whole country um, and recorded music from various parts of the country. So there was a real, the radio was really important in trying to forge these, these new sounds. And of course, um, the band SOS, um, which is seen as the first band to begin playing kizomba, or that sort of starts kizomba, actually emerges from the ranks of employees at the radio station. Um, so there's a there's a very kind of tight connection there. So um, I think I haven't answered all the questions, but I hope I've done a decent job. And thank you all for listening. I would love to be able to talk to you about this in person. Um, let me thank um, Hangar for this invitation to present. Um, to present my work and especially Marcella for the excellent work in the production. Thank you so much.